Today, the police will kill three people. And tomorrow, the police will kill three people. And the day after that, the police will kill three people because on average, the police in America every day kill three people, which amounts to about a thousand people a year. And those people happen to disproportionately be black people. And, you know, James Baldwin once said, the most despicable thing a person can be is indifferent to other people's pain. And so I just ask that you please not be indifferent. I want to be sensitive to the topic at heart here, but th th this speech starts off with tomorrow the police will kill more people and the next day police will kill three people. It, it sounds like police are out there murdering folks. I, I, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, great acting job by that guy. Maybe that's why he got an Oscar. Look, he didn't say anything about the weekend violence in Chicago this weekend. This goes on just in Chicago on a weekend basis, on a daily basis. 25 were shot, leaving five dead. Last week, 30 were shot including a seven-year-old girl, Jaslyn Adams, who was shot as she sat in a car in a McDonald's drive through This goof says nothing about that. It's like whistling past the graveyard. That's nothing but moral preening on his part. If he really knew what he was talking about, he'd know that police use of force that leads to death accounts for 0.02% of all homicides committed in the United States. Many of those, many, I didn't say all, black on black crime. So again, whistle past the graveyard, you know, play for the cameras, but you know, that stuff disgraceful. So does anybody even watch the Oscars anymore? I, well, we're going to find out when those ratings come in. And when, even when you watch a speech like that, you forget, hey, by the way, you have to remind viewers, that was the Oscars, by the way. That's what you were, that's what you were watching. I'm out of time with you. Sheriff David Clark joining us live here on this Monday. Uh, Sheriff, always appreciate your time. Now to a growing demand for answers in the death of Capitol Hill protester Ashley Babbitt. Just last month, the Department of Justice announced they will not pursue charges against the U.S. Capitol Police officer who fatally shot Babbitt on January 6th. Officials determining there was not enough evidence to support a criminal prosecution. Joining us to discuss is the attorney for Ashley Babbitt's family, Terry Roberts joining us on the program. Terry, thank you for, for taking the time. It's been um, almost four months since the incident. How's the family holding up? Um, pretty well. Uh, they're, they're obviously still in grief about things, but uh, they're doing fairly well. Um, you know, we recall what happened on January 6th, and we are still waiting for more answers. Uh, since her death, Ashley Babbitt's death, there's been a battle for transparency and a struggle to figure out what really happened there. What can you tell us about what's happening now in regards to her case? Well, I mean, I'm handling the civil action that will be filed. Uh, that's that's my role. Uh, we were the family and, and I were disappointed in the Department of Justice decision on this. Uh, but uh, my role is really to bring a civil action and, and in that way vindicate her rights. Um, and your response to as well, the Department of Justice's position that there isn't enough evidence specifically for, for any charges. In fact, uh, the name of the U.S. Capitol Police officer was, was not released uh, following the death. Right. And we uh, strongly disagree with the Department of Justice decision on this. We think the evidence is ample that uh, and would support criminal charges against the officer. Uh, clearly, the officer had the had a, a, a the required willfulness uh, in this uh, case. He clearly could see that she was. Uh, he could see that she was not armed. She did not present an immediate threat to him, and there was no legal justification for shooting her. In addition to that, he doesn't give any warnings. Uh, there is ample evidence he doesn't give warnings. Uh, we've talked to many of the people on, on Ashley's side of the door. Nobody heard a warning. Uh, I don't believe she even knew the officer was on the other side of the room. He's off to the, her left in a kind of concealing himself in a room. So there's no warning even before he shoots. This is a situation in which the officer could have easily um, arrested her if he had grounds to arrest her without using deadly force. So mm -hmm. egregious act of uh, excessive force should have been charged.
You, you say no warning, no legal justification for the shooting here. What kind of charges are you pursuing? We're pursuing a civil action. Hasn't been filed yet, but we'll mm -hmm. pursue civil action alleging the violation of Ashley's constitutional rights. Um, you know, following uh, her death, of course, we know she was an unarmed woman uh, shot fatally by police officers. In any other instance, you would normally see outrage from the public, of course, that, that this happened. And yet uh, there hasn't been much out public outrage, uh, again, from a police-involved shooting of an unarmed woman. Has the family ex expressed their thoughts on, on kind of the quietness that surrounded this case? Well, I don't know about the family. I mean, they're taking things in stride as best they can. But obviously, I think what disturbs most people is that there's a double standard at work here. If you were to change the circumstances, change the location a little bit, uh, it's a certainty that there would be charges. Um, obviously, the political climate is such that uh, charges are not favored here. And it's, it's really bothers us that there is a double standard at work. Does the family believe that it does have to do with politics? Um, Ashley Babbitt was, was a Trump supporter. Well, uh, it clearly has, that has everything to do with it. Unfortunately, it shouldn't. Hmm. Uh, Terry Roberts uh, joining us on the program. We appreciate you taking the time, Terry. You'll have to come back and, and share us an update when you, when you have the chance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, tensions rising between the U.S. and Turkey this after President Biden officially recognized the killing of 1.5 million Armenians over 100 years ago as genocide. White House correspondent John Gizzi is joining us live now, standing by in Washington with the latest on this. Uh, John, how significant is Biden's decisions here? Well, very significant because it involves U.S. relations with Turkey. I might add that the president before issuing his condemnation of Armenian genocide, had his first ever telephone conversation as president with Turkey's President Erdogan. All sources say it did not go well. Like virtually every Turkish official, President Erdogan has condemned uh, the denunciation of the events of 106 years ago as genocide, which in effect put it on the same level as the World War II Holocaust. In addition, he's called it the so-called Armenian genocide lie. He acknowledges the death, but said most of the 1.5 million were due to illness and to famine as well. In any event, the argument is pretty much over as far as the U.S. is concerned. President Biden finally issued the statement that the Armenian community has begged for from presidents for decades. Now, what will happen next? Well, already this morning, the Turkish foreign minister has called in our ambassador to Ankara, David Satterfield, and is expected to give him the diplomatic dressing down for this. But there's more that could happen. Turkey could well, very easily, suspend operations at Incirlik, that is the Air Force base that Turkey shares with the U.S. and other NATO allies. This would be very serious given its pivotal location in the Middle East. In addition, uh, the Turks could easily step up and play even rougher with their enemies, the Kurds, in northern Syria. The Kurds are U.S. allies and sworn enemies of Turkey. And finally, tomorrow, there'll be a major conference between Turkey and Greece over the future of Cyprus. Since 1974, that country has been divided between Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots. And now there's talk of reunification. Turkey could walk out and blow up the conference. For now, it's safe to say diplomatic relations between the United States and Turkey are very, very bad and they could grow very, very worse. Back to you. John Gizzi there live in Washington for us with the latest on that. John, thank you very much. Meanwhile, Alex Kramer standing by with the latest on the headlines. Hello, Alex. Hello, Sean. Thank you. Here's an update on some other stories making news right now. 
Well, Kevin McCarthy is defending former President Trump's response to the January 6th riot. Now, the House Minority Leader was asked to confirm an account from fellow representative Jamie Herrera Butler, who said the former president was indifferent to McCarthy's calls for help. Now, McCarthy instead says that Trump ended the call by saying he put out a video telling his supporters to stop. Now, the two have not spoken about the events of January 6th since that day. And this, President Biden's new tax plan is an assault on investment, according to former Trump chief economist Larry Kudlow. Now, Kudlow says the tax proposals will stunt economic growth across the country, eventually dragging down family income, calling the new proposal a progressive left-wing ideology tax. Now, Kudlow warns that any increase could undermine the potential for an economic boom. And finally, the U.S. military has started their complete withdrawal from Afghanistan, marking the beginning of the end for America's nearly two Two decade war in the country. It's just two weeks after President Biden announced that all U.S. forces would be withdrawn from the country by September 11th of this year. Roughly 3,000 U.S. troops, 7,000 NATO troops, and 18,000 contractors still remain in the region. Now, those are just some of the stories we're following right now, but for breaking news, head on over to Newsmax.com. Welcome back. A new CBS poll shows a large number of Republicans think the jury got the Derek Chauvin verdict wrong. The jury found Chauvin guilty of second-degree murder, third-degree murder, and also second-degree manslaughter. But about 75 percent of those surveyed thought the verdict was correct, with 25 percent saying it was not. And of that 25 percent, more than 50 percent were conservative and also male. All right, we're going to keep up here with that. Let's welcome in our uh, panelists. Hal Lambert, former Ted Cruz National Finance Chair and founder and CEO of Point Bridge Capital. You got Jennifer Kearns here, host of All American Radio and publisher of AllAmericanNews.com. Dino Scaros is going to join us as well. He's a presidential historian and an immigration attorney. He's also the author of Trumped Up Charges, which is the book right here on your screen. Uh, Hal Lambert, I want to start with you on this one. Your reaction to that poll, I know we kind of briefly rattled off um, some numbers to you, but 46% of Republicans think that the Chauvin verdict was wrong. Are you surprised by that? What are your thoughts on it? Well, I think it's really a reflection of Republicans' trust of the media. I think that's really a, a reflection on that. Uh, they, they don't like the media. The media narrative from the very beginning was was guilty until proven innocent, uh, and and that went on throughout the trial and 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 up to the trial. You also had you know Maxine Waters coming out and threatening uh, violence if there wasn't a guilty verdict. So I think that's really a reflection of that. Uh, most most Americans didn't watch that trial. Uh, I, I didn't watch the trial. It's on during the day. Most people are working. Uh, so they really don't have a, a way to look at the trial in, in, in full and see whether or not he, he was guilty. The verdict was guilty, and, and so you have to go with that. And that's that's what I believe. If, if the, the verdict came back guilty, he's guilty. Uh, but I think when you poll it, uh, people tend to push back mainly be on the Republican side because of that media narrative. Mm. Again, of course, guilty on all charges. We re reported it right as the verdict came in. Uh, Jennifer Kearns, your thoughts on, on Republicans thinking uh, perhaps this verdict was wrong? Again, it was just a sample, and this sample is included in the polls, and take polling how you will. Yeah, I was actually surprised that the number was that low. Uh, you look at Republicans across the board, they firmly believe in law and order. I think, um, you know, the, the support for police in this country, the majority of whom, 90 percent of whom are good, hardworking public servants, is also very high in the Republican Party. I think the reason the number was below 50 percent, uh, because people are afraid to tell pollsters what they truly think. We saw that in, in the last couple of elections, dating back to even the 2014 midterms, uh, that the pollsters got it wrong by about 10 points. So. I was actually surprised it was lower than I thought it would be. There was an interesting uh, piece of sound kind of on this same topic. Uh, Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison, a name we've heard a lot, uh, actually appeared on 60 Minutes last night. He actually says he felt badly for the defendant. Listen. I spent 16 years as a criminal defense lawyer, so I will admit I felt a little bad for the defendant. I think he deserved to be convicted. But he's a human being. So just to be clear, he's talking about uh, Derek Chauvin in this. He's, he went on to say he didn't think the judge should go light or heavy on Chauvin's sentencing. Um, as you know, there are 
obviously would be a lot of pressure because in, in, in June, the judge will have to decide his fate of how many years uh, that Chauvin would serve. In the state of Minnesota here, I believe it would be right at 12 and a half years of uh, uh, the, the guidelines for that state to sentence Chauvin. But again, there, there, there will be, there still is outcry there for some of the harshest penalties to come down on Chauvin. Uh, Dino Scaros, your reaction to hearing the attorney general there? Well, uh, it's not very often, but I actually thought he gave a good interview. I agreed with a lot of what he said. I thought it was also great that he pointed out that when the police pull over a white physician and don't throw him on the ground and put a knee to his neck, it's not because he is their white brother. It's because they may think, okay, this guy may have connections. This guy may know a lot of lawyers. This guy may know the governor. I thought that was a great point. I also wanted to talk about this poll, though. You see, the average American hears the word murder, and they think it must mean intentional. They don't understand there's something in the law called felony murder, which is basically accidental murder, okay? So if they ask the question, do you think uh, George Floyd died? The answer is obviously yes. And do you think he was uh, killed maybe even accidentally? And the answer there is yes. You can be convicted of murder based on that. And a lot of people confuse what the law is with what the law, how they want it to be. And so I think that's why you got those answers. Murder is not always intentional. Hmm. Well, the, the jury obviously came to the conclusion guilty again on all charges. As Sean said, we are awaiting the sentencing decision to come in. So, with this new bill, we've learned that more than 30,000 felons could effectively get their right to vote back automatically. Uh, what's your response to this new legislation? You know, the Albany Democrats, who have total one-party control of our state government, have decided to prioritize criminals once again ahead of law-abiding, hardworking New York men and women. It's completely unacceptable. And all hardworking New Yorkers should be really you know, disgusted and outraged by what's going on here. We're talking about cop killers, pedophiles, and criminals of the worst of the worst of the worst, of the worst vote while they're still on parole. You know, prior to this legislation passing, if some of those worst of the worst criminals were released on parole, they still had to follow the punishment that was laid out, that was agreed to or that was decided on by a judge and jury. Now, they'll be able to vote despite still being on parole. And to me, that's, that's unacceptable. You know, uh, following the 2020 election, there has been a big push by states looking into election reform. And I want to talk to you about the timing of it all, this decision again by Democrats to look into this, uh, this move again to allow ex-felons to get their voting rights back automatically. Do you, do you take anything away from the timing of it? Listen, I think that this is just completely unacceptable. And actually, part of the debate during um, legislative session during this bill was saying that the next step would be to grant convicts behind bars the right to vote by absentee ballot. So starting with restoring voting rights of cop killers, pedophiles, the worst of the worst criminals who are still on parole, we're talking about individuals who committed serious felony offenses who are still serving out part of their sentence on parole, but now they want to go the next step even beyond this piece of legislation, which would grant felons behind bars in jail the right to vote via absentee ballot. I think that this shows you what one party Democrat control gives us in Albany. And I think it also shows us why we need to be very concerned about one party control in Washington, D.C. That's the reason I strongly oppose this legislation and will continue to do so. And it's also a reason why you mentioned I am running for Congress in the New York 18th Congressional District because we need to end one party control in Washington, D.C. There needs to be a check and balance in government. There needs to be a, a need to compromise, a reason to have honest, robust debate. Mm. Without it, you get stuff like this, felons on parole, cop killer felons on parole voting. You know, this, this has come at a time when there's been such tension across our country when it comes to uh, regular citizens and even how they view police officers. We've heard calls from Democrat lawmakers to defund the police. At the same time, we've seen crime levels spike in cities like New York City, as well as Chicago, Los Angeles, Portland. Um, what do you make of these calls to take away funds from the police when perhaps uh, pe people have said, you know what, these guys, they need some more money, right? 
right now so they can have more reform, more training in place? Well, you're absolutely correct. It's just um, a disgrace that any elected official would support limiting funding or defunding police. Sadly, in New York, we just passed a budget that I strongly opposed that actually gives the governor's unelected budget staffer, an unelected staffer, the ability to unilaterally, without a check and balance, cut up to 50 percent of state funding to our local police departments if they do not comply with Governor Cuomo's new mandates on policing. I mean, this is the type of really just anti-police actions that we are seeing um, in, in the congressional district. I have my opponent, Sean Patrick Maloney, who hired anti-law enforcement staffers at the DCCC, who said outrageous things such as looting is an acceptable form of protest. We had over 500 NYPD officers injured this past summer during the looting that occurred. We have so many cops, law enforcement, active retired that live in my district. They find that you're completely unacceptable. They do not want that rhetoric from their elected officials. And our federal government, our state government has to do better. We have to fully support our law enforcement at, at, at every level. We have to have our men and women in blue, we have to have their back so they can keep our community safe. They can be safe doing their job. And it, any rhetoric to the contrary is completely unacceptable. All right. He's promising to stand with our men and women in blue, the police officers, Colin Schmidt, running for Congress. We appreciate you taking the time joining us here on National Report. Thank you. Hey, I'm Rob Finnerty. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please join the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe too. hit the bell icon to be alerted to breaking news. And remember, there's a whole lot more on Newsmax TV, America's fastest growing cable news network. Newsmax TV, where real news for real people.